Hello friends, welcome back to Dr. Jackie's Academy. In today's lecture, I will discuss about a very important disease that is bronchial asthma. You know, bronchial asthma is a, one of the very common diseases uh, in the in our society, and lot of things have been known about the bronchial asthma. But in today's lecture, I will restrict my uh, teaching to the pathogenesis of and the clinical symptoms of the bronchial asthma. So let's start. So in this video, I will discuss the definition of bronchial asthma, then what are the pathological changes which occur in the bronchi, then what are the causes that will lead to asthma, that is etiology, and how we can classify the asthma, what are the clinical symptoms, and how we can diagnose uh, asthma in our clinics. So start with the definition of bronchial asthma. So, uh, I am telling the key features of the asthma that come in the definition of asthma that is first of all it is a chronic inflammatory disorder that means there is a persistent inflammation in the bronchi in the lungs. Then uh, another important feature is there is a reversible that means it is a transient you can revert back to normal condition airway that is of the bronchi obstruction that means in a reversible manner the bronchi they are constricted and then if you see the pathological changes there is an abnormal bronchial hyperactivity to a stimulus that means if a stimulus comes in the uh, lungs then the bronchi they respond in an excessive manner in a high they show hyperactivity they show hyper responsiveness and what is that stimulus and most of the time this stimulus is actually a allergic or an allergic agent so these three key features chronic inflammation reversible airway obstruction and third abnormal bronchial hyperactivity they, they are the key features of the bronchial asthma now we can see with the help of this uh, animation if this is the lungs and these are the bronchi this is the allergen and if we magnify this bronchi and then you can see if this allergen comes these interact with, uh, with the cells in the bronchi and ultimately there is a you can see you can see this uh, uh, the constriction of the lumen that is bronchoconstriction okay so this is the thing which happens in the asthma so now important features of asthma that I have, I have already told in the definition bronchial, inflam bronchial inflammation, chronic inflammation, then hyperactivity to a stimulus that is to allergic, uh, to allergic, and then third, reversible bronchospasm. Three key features of the asthma. Now, I will show what are the pathological changes that will take place in the asthma if there is an allergen which is persistent. If the allergen is coming again and again, what will happen? So let's say a person is exposed to allergen again and again, it will lead to increase in the number and the size of goblet cells. This is a key pathological change. Goblet cells number is increased, their size is increased. As a result, there is an increase in the mucus production and more mucus ultimately will become more viscous. So there is a viscous mucus and this will form a mucosal plug. This mucosal plug will be obstructed in the airway and this is important feature in the asthma. Second thing, uh, as I told, it is a chronic inflammation. So in, in response to allergen, there is a recruitment of eosinophils and mast cells. And there is number of inflammatory mediators which are responsible for producing damage to the bronchial cells. If the cells are damaged, so you can say the underlying uh, nerve fibers, receptors, they are exposed. That means there is exposure of the cholinergic receptors. Now if the cholinergic receptors are exposed, parasympathetic nervous system whose neurotransmitter is actually acetylcholine is able to produce more actions. Okay, so acetylcholine or parasympathetic nervous system activate these cholinergic receptors which leads to the bronchoconstriction. So this is a key point, acetylcholine, parasympathetic nervous system, cholinergic receptors, they produce bronchoconstriction. Another thing, now this damage of the bronchial cell is followed by compensatory changes in the bronchi. 
which lead to increase the turnover of the smooth muscle. The cells try to increase their number, they will increase their proliferation. So as a result, there is hyperplasia and hypertrophy of the smooth muscles. Okay, hyperplasia means increasing the number of the cells. Hypertrophy means increasing the number of, uh, increasing the size of the cell. And this hyperplasia and hypertrophy is responsible for the another key feature that is hyperactivity of the bronchi. And this hyperactivity, hyper responsiveness of bronchi is responsible for the bronchoconstriction. So three key features: number one, goblet cells increasing the number. Number two, hyperplasia, hypertrophy of the smooth muscles, and third is the chronic inflammation. So this is what I am saying, pathological changes in the bronchi, hyperplasia, hypertrophy of the bronchial smooth muscles, hyper hyperplasia of the goblet cells and persistent inflammatory changes. So these are the pathological changes in the bronchi. Coming down to what are the things meant that may lead to the asthma, that is etiology. So most important is the allergens. So there is a long list of allergens, I am just telling some of those dust, pollen grains, fungal spores, insect parts, okay? then emotions okay? like anxiety, stress, this is again an important factor in the precipitation of the asthma. Then environmental factors like environmental pollutants, cold air, ozone, carbon dioxide, uh, sulfur dioxide, nitrogen dioxide, these are other important factors. Then exercise, if the person is asthmatic and he does vigorous exercise, that vigorous exercise may be problematic. It may lead to the precipitation of the asthma. Then respiratory infections, viral infections like influenza or para-influenza virus may also precipitate the attack of asthma. Drugs, if the person is taking drugs like in the seeds or aspirin, which is a common drug for the relief of the headache, it may lead to the development of asthma. How it will lead to development of asthma, I will discuss in my next lecture. Then in the beta blockers, beta blockers can also lead to the development of uh, asthma in the persons who are susceptible to, not in all persons, but in susceptible persons. Then occupational asthma, that means the persons who are working in certain industries because of their occupation, like the workers working in the chemical industry, plastic industry, rubber industry, these kind of things. They are exposed to pollutants, those things which are arising in that industry that may lead to the asthma. So this, this is a list of the agents that may lead to the development of asthma, that is etiology. Coming down to we can, how we can classify the asthma depending on the precipitating agents. Intrinsic asthma and extrinsic asthma. Extrinsic asthma means uh, there are some external factors, exogenous factors that may trigger the development of asthma like allergens. Now these allergens they lead to development of immunological reactions and uh, there is basically a type 1 hypersensitivity which is localized not a widespread but localized to the bronchi region only. So this immunological reaction is, is responsible for the development of asthma which happens when the allergens come. Examples allergic asthma which is also called as atopic asthma or occupational asthma. Now there is an intrinsic asthma that means all the factors are present inside the body, endogenous factors like anxiety, fatigue, stress or emotions. These kind of things if they lead, they can lead to the asthma then we say it is an intrinsic asthma. In the intrinsic asthma the reactions are mainly non-immunological. There is a bronchoconstriction, more of the parasympathetic involvement instead of the immunological reactions. We can also classify the asthma depending on the severity of the symptoms, like mild intermittent asthma. That means symptoms are mild and they appear on and off. Sometimes they appear and the person becomes normal. But sometimes the mild symptoms they persist for a long period. This is called as mild persistent asthma. Then we are having moderate persistent asthma or we are having a severe persistent asthma. So how they are classified depending on how many attacks of asthma they take place and whether the activity of a person is reduced or not in between the attack. Like in a mild intermittent asthma, the attack is less than two times per week. But in severe persistent, it happens throughout the day. And in mild and moderate, the attacks are more than two 
per week. And in the nocturnal, in the night time, the uh, less than two attacks in a month, but it happens almost every night in this sphere persistent. And interference with the activity when there is no attack, person is normal, asymptomatic. But even in in this sphere condition, person is not normal. In all the conditions, there is a frequent exacerbations and decreased physical activity. So this we can classify into four types depending on how many attacks they take place or how it interferes with the activity of the person. Coming down to the another important thing, what are what person actually this uh, how they what are the symptoms? Okay, what are the complaints of the patient? The most common complaint of the patient is the dyspnea. He is not able to respire in a normal manner. He feel difficulty in respiration. And a very characteristic feature is the wheezing. A special kind of a sound is produced when he takes the inspiration or exhalation. Inspiration and and wheezing is called as high pitched whistling sound, like a whistle. A sound is produced. It is a characteristic symptom of asthma. But remember, wheezing is not only in the asthma. Wheezing can also take place in other another obstructive diseases. But wheezing is an important feature of the asthma. The person feels tightness in the chest and there is a burning sensation. So as I told, wheezing can is not exclusive for the asthma, but it can also happen in other obstructive disorder. So now how we can diagnose the asthma? Number one, depending on the symptoms, physician can tell you are suffering from the asthma. Second thing, he will perform a test in the laboratory, spirometry. It is an instrument. Okay, when person is asked to take the inspiration and expiration, so it is a respiratory test, and and you will come to know during the test, person's expiratory volume is reduced, particularly the forced expiratory volume is reduced. That is, there is a problem in the expiration. And if you give bronchodilators, which remove the obstruction, dilate the bronchi, there is improvement in the functioning. So this is the spirometry then. Then we can perform the blood test. You can remove the blood, estimate the number of IgE, calculate the number of eosinophils. If both are increased, they tell it is an allergic asthma. Then perform the X-ray, and you can see the hyperinflation. Hyperinflation means presence of air. The uh, bronchi, they are. Uh, the lungs they are inflated because person is not able to expire the air. Air is not coming outside the body in a normal manner. Okay, so there is a hyperinflation in the asthma. So this is what I wanted to discuss in today's lecture. In the upcoming video, we will continue with the asthma. We will discuss in detail about how the asthma develops actually pathogenesis of asthma, particularly the allergic asthma and the exercise induced asthma.